Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Behind me is a 2JZ powered 1970 Datsun 240Z. We've raced it out at Bonneville and at El Mirage. This car's been over 250 miles an hour. It's here at Real Street, so I can build a new engine for it. For those of you that don't recognize the Datsun, we purchased it as a whole completed race car off of Bring a Trailer. Another team had taken it out to El Mirage and taken it out to Bonneville, but they couldn't quite get it in the record book. So we got the car within our possession, changed some things with the tuning, put my buddy Red Stoffer in it. He went over 250 miles an hour at Bonneville, got into the 200 mile an hour club. Then we took Mark Conti in the car at El Mirage, which is a 1.3 mile dirt track got him in the Dirty Two Club. During that process, the driver accessory belt had fallen off more than once, so the car had made some amount of time wide open throttle without a functioning water pump because the ear on the engine block had been broken off in the past, and when they welded it back on, it wasn't quite straight, so it kept pitching the belt off. So we knew that we had overheated the engine, but these types of things happen, so we don't know exactly what kind of damage had occurred. It's still a running engine, although cylinders five and six aren't as strong as the other cylinders. We're gonna take the engine out, go through it, tell you what's wrong with it, build a new engine, get it back in the car, and get it back out to the West Coast so we can participate in events like the SCTA Speed Week event at Bonneville Salt Flats and the El Mirage 1.3 mile dirt track. the exhaust buckets there's a couple buckets that are starting to deteriorate and if you look up close to them you can see this star pattern in the center of the bucket and that's generally the beginning of the end of the bucket long time at high rpm you know this engine's going to spend over a mile or two at 8,000 rpm so these are long runs so it's a really a great test of the components as a whole uh, these are old school gsc cast cams um, and you can just see starting to get after a couple of these exhaust buckets. One, one is really starting to show and the others look reasonably well for the amount of time they have on them. Um, I don't know when these buckets were new. Uh, I only know what we've done with the engine. The car had been out to El Mirage and Bonneville before, but I don't know if these buckets were, were from the first time the engine went together or if they were replaced incrementally. So this engine has uh, the old school, um, basically the wrong size washer and the head bolt. So the factory Toyota washer was around 750 OD. And then when the ARP kits first came out, they had a washer that was a smaller OD. And that went on for a couple of years. And the guys that caught it would just use the factory washer. And the guys that didn't catch it would use a washer that was a smaller OD. And then you could kind of mess the pad up that the, that the washer would sit on so we need to look at this head and see if the pad that the washer sits on is, um, is messed up. Yeah, it is. If you look down in here, you can see that there is a ring and that ring is at a different level than the factory receiver for the washer. So you can cut, kind of catch this pick in this ring. So what was happening, this is years ago, but ARP had 
these smaller OD washers in the kits. And, and as a comparison, here's the revised washer. This is what you'll get if you've bought a kit in the last, you know, four or five years. And this is the factory Toyota washer. But there was a period of time in the older kits that they had this smaller washer. And if the, the technician didn't catch it and just reuse the factory washer, he would end up creating this problem where the washer would actually sink down into the cylinder head. And that can be corrected with a small cutter and you can kind of resurface that area of the cylinder head. So that'll be one operation that gets done on this head while it's off to be serviced. Another thing we'll do while we have the engine apart is look and see what valve springs are in the cylinder head and make sure that they're up to task. So on those buckets that are a little bit uh, beat up, we're gonna look at the retainers and the locks and see if the valves are floating and check the installed height and open pressure to make sure that we have enough valve spring for the kind of continuous uh, wide open throttle that an engine like this sees. You know, most engines are not operated um, at such high RPM for so long like they are in land speed racing. So you really get to test components to their limits, which is uh, pretty awesome. So if you look at these two ears on the front of the block, these both were broken off the engine block at some point in this engine's life. So they're not straight. And what that was doing was it was pulling the alternator off at an angle and then the, the alternator and the water pump belt would fall off at speed, which is pretty terrible because you have an engine that um, is under a high load of stress and under a high load of heat for a long time and then the water pump belt falls off. So when we first ran this car at Bonneville and El Mirage, that was happening. And we later went to a 16 volt battery and um, an aftermarket water pump setup that we've been working to engineer. And that kind of got rid of the problem, but the engine had already been insulted. So this engine has been uh, severely overheated. So there's two things that are glaring with the head off. Number one and six on the exhaust side of the piston, even though the piston is zero deck and the head gasket is 51 thousandths thick, it's cleaned all the carbon off the edge of the two pistons on the exhaust side. And then on almost every cylinder, you have these vertical gouges. So it could be the way the forging is shaped. I don't know what kind of pistons they are yet, but we're gonna get them out of the engine and see if there wasn't enough piston to wall for the amount of heat that was being generated. And we're keeping in mind that we've overheated the engine before. So we're not gonna be overly critical. It's not gonna be a brand problem per se. It's gonna be a clearance problem based off of the heat. So the longer you run it under heat, the more things can change shape. And unfortunately for us, again, we, were, we ran it with the water pump belt off. So for some period of time, you know, at least a, a mile. So it's pretty ugly. But we've got these vertical gouges, another reason why this block won't be reused. But let's get the pistons out of it, see what kind of pistons they are, and see if we can get a accompanying mark on the pistons themselves. Not good etiquette. It looks like someone has hammered around on the rod bolt with an air tool. The top of it's chewed up. These are our Carrillo rods. Uh, the bolts are very expensive, but the bolts are going to have to be replaced because if there was enough carelessness to um, mishandle the bolt like that, then you have to assume um, that there could be other abuse involved and you wouldn't risk a rod bolt failure because it's a catastrophic failure. So looks like someone's just kind of hammered around on some of these rod bolts. So we'll, we'll have to change those out. Well, there's our drag mark in the bore the piston buttons are too tall. 
so they've made contact in the bore on each side. So these buttons could have been shortened up a bit. The piston itself doesn't look bad. The pin bore looks nice. These engines aren't run very hard. You know, this engine's like, I think at El Mirage we had 28 pounds of boost in it. And at Bonneville we had 25 or 26 pounds. So it's not like drag racing where you just have the thing like screws in, trying to make it to the finish line. The finish line is pretty far away. So you have to pace yourself. The upper bearing looks fine. It's a little bit of particulate. The lower bearing, not as nice. It seems like uh, one and six look about the same. Another thing I see is the main caps are backwards. The bearing tangs on a Jay-Z, they face each other. So if you have a set of real street main caps, the logo is facing forward and these are all on backwards. So there's that. One of the cool things about the caps is uh, they're, they're very close to a honeable state when you buy them. So there isn't a lot of work to get a set of real street caps on a block and honed up properly. Some of the early caps, you could eat up a lot of time in getting them fitted and getting thrust clearance and so on and so forth. For those of you that haven't seen these before, these are pin buttons. And as we mentioned before, the some are dragging on the bores. And this is just a replacement for a circlip or a spiral lock that would normally hold the pin in place. So a lot of high end, uh, like top fuel, stuff like that, they'll use pin buttons instead of clips because at some point some of the high clips pop out. And if you're servicing the engine in the field, like between rounds in a drag racing environment, these, as you see, just slide out. You don't have to um, dig at them with a pick and poke yourself in the finger and get your thumb sore. You just use these little guys and they, they just slide right, right out. The marks that you see on the lower bearings, I would say is from D-cell, you know, long, long periods of D-cell from high RPM. The upper bearings actually look reasonably well for what's been going on and how the engine's used, but the lower bearings are starting to show somewhere. Four thousands. junk. It's actually trash from the bearing or material from the bearing collected right here in this reservoir. You know, at the party line, there's a little reservoir in the bearing and there's actually a bearing particulate loaded up in there. It's not good. You got some more where the bearing surface is actually coming apart here. So nothing really entered and just flaked apart and drug that material across the face of the bearing. Same thing on this one. Just the bearing peeling apart. The other thing that's kind of tricky on these engines, probably the biggest single same thing again. The biggest single problem area in machining a 2JZ for caps uh, is the align bore and align hone process because it's a fairly long engine and the mandrel's heavy. So you have to work the engine block kind of from both sides and get it to size um, the best you can quickly because the steel cuts differently than the cast iron. 
So I know it kind of sounds like we're beating our own drum when we say the real street main caps fit really nice, but it's, it's done with a high level of intention to raise the chance of success for a main cap install. Because if you get a bunch of taper in the main bore, you're chasing clearances and bearing crush or worse, the engine just doesn't live long. And there are guys that will work it and end up blowing, you know, enlarging the number one and number seven main, and then going back and cutting the cap and just opening that hole back up. It's really terrible, uh, terrible approach, but unfortunately I'd seen it done. So if you're putting caps on a Jay-Z or any other long engine, make sure that the machine shop you're dealing with is, um, has a high level of success and uh, and I feel that you're better off buying these caps than other brand caps because of the amount of fitment time that goes into these caps. Um, there's less chance of them taking a lot of material off the OEM tunnel, which then leaves them um, with less of a roadmap to get it right. And to the experienced machinists watching this video, you may scoff at that because you can do that task over and over and over again with a high level of su success. Not everyone's there. So um, the closer the cap is to fitting the block right out of the box, the less machining that goes on, the higher chance of success for the average machine shop to, um, to perform on an engine like this and have it come out correctly. Check out all this material. This also can be from, if you notice that uh, no one took the plugs out of the mains. So whenever you buy an engine through us, it's a CNC operation that leaves you with an O-ring plug. There's just material piled up underneath this main bearing. And I haven't touched it, I just took it out of the engine and there it is just sitting there caught in the reservoir um, of the bearing which is pretty disappointing because I'm sure that the man that paid to build this engine paid good money, but you just have uh, material from machining right there on my finger. So um, this is why when you get an engine back from the machine shop, it's your responsibility to clean it before you assemble it and sometimes you pay a little bit more and you get a little more. Sometimes you pay a little more and you get a great engine. But this is, uh, this is not cool. Now this main bearing is closing up. So if you look, there's actually an air gap between the cap and the bearing. So this bearing is uh, is starting to shrink up and grab on the crank. So this is on its way to a spun, what everyone references is a spun bearing. So you can see that the bearing's overheated, started to close up. It's no longer located in the housing tight. Now the block side still has a little bit of um, friction there, but not a lot. So it's also loose. You know, the bearing should snap down into the main register tight so it can bleed heat out of the back. So this bearing is also wasted. So this engine wasn't going to go much further with the mains in this condition. So looking down the main saddles, there's some fretting where the cap is um, vibrating on the engine block, but there's also a lot of old staining through here. So another thing you do when you're putting caps on is you either drag a cut through there or drag a stone through there and clean and flatten that surface. But the amount of fretting that's going on, um, I'd go to a 625 main stud on this engine because of the amount of time it's wide open. And, um, you know, it's still a thousand horsepower Jay-Z. It's not a, it's not that it's not a powerful engine. It's just not in the 2000 horsepower range that everyone lives in on the internet but it's still a high output engine. And you can see these caps are walking around a bit, but they, they didn't clean the registers out before they fit the caps, which is another thing that um, preferably should be done 
to, uh, to ensure that there's as much mating surface flat on the cap and on the block, allowing them to stick together the best they can. So some engines have doweled caps and others are just in these registers like on the Jay-Z. So if you look at the way the register is shaped, the cap kind of squeezes down in between this. So between here and here is an interference fit. And as the engine is abused, that um, kind of opens up where if you ever take an engine apart that's been beat on a lot, the caps are gonna be loose in the registers. And some guys will weld on, physically weld on the caps and grind on the caps and fit the caps back into registers individually. It's just another thing that I guess if there was a topic to talk about here, um, aside from my small complaints on the other stuff would be main caps are a big deal. Deal with a machine shop that has a large success rate with main caps because if you don't do it well, you don't get a great engine out of it. You'll have some pretty weird abnormal wear in the process. I would say the single biggest thing that you can take away from this video, even if you're not a 2JZ guy, is don't ever transport the engine block with any studs hanging out of any accessory ears or engine mount locations, because while those ears are incredibly strong to do the role they were designed to do, if you boop this stud, it just breaks the ear off. It happens really easily. And then you have a problem that isn't easily repaired and can create other situations like we're into with this engine. Some of the failures that we've experienced were heat related, heat related because the belt wouldn't stay on, the belt wouldn't stay on because the ears were broken off the block and then reattached poorly. So just before you transport your engine block to and from the machine shop, make sure there's no hardware or studs hanging out of the sides of the block. It's quick, it's easy, it's simple. It's your responsibility to protect your investment. So we have the engine completely apart on the bench. Some of these parts are gonna be reused, not the block between the broken ear and what's going on in the mains. This engine will go in the dumpster, but we do have a lot of reusable parts and we had an engine that gave up uh, some really good memories. So we got two guys in the 200 mile hour club, one at Bonneville, one at El Mirage. We were able to achieve that in a relatively short amount of time without a lot of work involved. So we're very grateful for what the engine offered us. And we are understanding that having runaway temperatures when the belt was flying off is not good for any engine. Remember guys, the better you have control of the temperature, whether it be oil temperature and water temperature, the easier it is for the cylinder to stay in control of itself and stay out of knock. So this engine had a hard life just based off of what happened to it from a cooling standpoint with the belt off of it, let alone the assembly errors that it faced. But nonetheless, it gave it up, doesn't owe us anything. We can get a fresh engine in the car, get back out there and have some fun. Hope you've enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time. Thank you.